Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello to you with a program from Israel looking at the news. We look behind the scenes and we have guests. And in the, in the studio today, we have uh, Rabbi Dov Lippmann. Thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure to be here. And we're going to be talking about the uh, recent Israeli election. And we're also going to be looking at the holiday, the Feast of Shavuot. And uh, this is the, the um, front line Front lines from the Jerusalem Post. You can see on here um, that Netanyahu won the election, uh, and it says the Wizard of Balfour Street and the Jerusalem Post frontline supplement recently ran the news story: the Wizard of Balfour Street. Balfour Street in Jerusalem is where the Prime Minister lives, and has been de he's been described by the Jerusalem Post also as a, magi a magician. That's on the on the back of there. We can say it says the magician strikes again. And it says that uh, he's uh, amazingly has been elected prime minister for the fifth time in 23 years. Most impressive achievement. And how did he do that, Dove? This is just amazing because the polls were uh, the polls were showing for the um, other parties, and then they were going to the Likud. So how did Netanyahu manage to pull this off again? So first of all, I think it's important to understand what does it mean he won. Uh, the election. If you look at the final results, uh, the Likud party headed by Netanyahu won 35 out of 120 seats and the contending blue and white party won 35 seats. So one looking at that would say, okay, it's a tie. Right. How, did, how did he win? Uh, but Israel's a parliamentary system and uh, someone has to put together a coalition of a majority of the Knesset seats. There's 120 seats in the Knesset. So someone needs to put together 61. Israel as a country has definitely shifted more towards the right uh, politically. It has definitely shifted more religious, traditional. And therefore, Netanyahu was the natural natural partner for the other parties that made it into the Knesset and therefore without much trouble at all, he was able to put together uh, 65 uh, seats that would form a coalition, whereas Blue and White was stuck somewhere around uh, 45 seats. So the Prime Minister won the election not just because of the number of seats Likud received, but also because he was able to get put together the coalition around him. Now, he's called a wizard uh, because He's faced, he faced those elections with uh, an indictment uh, hanging above him, the uh, stories of corruption and the lavish lifestyle, and is he really just taking care of himself? But at the end of the day, he was able to come to the people of Israel and say, I'm your guy. Uh, Israel, thank God, is safe and secure. Look at what's happening diplomatically with countries all around the world. Uh, look at Israel economically. We've become a world power. And when people went to vote, uh, whether they voted for Likud or for parties that were going to support Likud, they said to themselves, I, we don't know if there's corruption or not. Maybe we're uncomfortable with that. But overall, we're happy with how things are in Israel. And let's stick with the guy who's brought us there instead of the risk of someone new. I just want you to explain just very quickly about the uh, system in Israel, because you, you watching home might understand how the parliament works. Um, when you vote, when you go to vote, you vote for a part. You don't vote for a person. You don't vote for the prime minister. You vote for a party. Correct. Israel is a, a parliamentary system, like I said, uh, and there's no regional representation. Nobody votes for their member of Knesset in the area of the country where they live. There are national lists. There were over 40 parties. 40 parties that ran uh, in these elections, but only close to 10 actually got in. You have to win 3.25 percent of the vote, about four seats, uh, to get in to the Knesset. Uh, so most of the parties did not get in. There were about 350,000 votes that went nowhere, that just are wasted. Uh, they, this, they, the, the, the people who voted for them have no representation, essentially, in the Knesset. But amongst those 10 parties that got in, the votes are divided up by percentage. Whatever percentage of the votes that you get in your party, uh, that's how many seats you have in the Knesset. But like you said, nobody voted for Netanyahu or for his contender, Benny Gantz. They voted for their parties. After the elections, every party goes into the president of Israel and recommends who do they think should put together a coalition. And that process happened uh, before Passover. And uh, it was very clear from those results. You had 65 for Netanyahu, 45 uh, for Gantz, and then you had uh, 10 uh, from the Arab parties in Israel where they re recommended nobody. 
Uh, so you, that this was a situation. So the final score was really 65, 45 to 10. And right. then Netanyahu works with the parties in it that, that recommended him to put together a coalition. So the, the, there's some strength and weaknesses. The strength, I guess, is that in the democracy in Israel is that other parties can have a say. The weakness is that they can uh, lever of course, leverage of their own agendas on, onto, onto the government, and that's, that's not always good. That's correct. Now, you, you've been there yourself. You, you were a member of Knesset. Now, there are a lot of people asking, Dove, if you're going to re-enter politics or you're going to join one of the parties. And uh... I will say this. I've very much enjoyed the break. Uh, I took a break a year ago and uh, more family time, more f time to uh, focus on, on some other projects. Uh, there definitely is a pull. Uh, to want to be involved, to try to make a difference. Uh, right now, thank God, I'm able to make a difference from outside the Knesset. Uh, but if the right opportunity uh, presents itself, I certainly would uh, at least explore uh, the idea of, of going back in. Maybe next time we'll be in the Knesset speaking and uh, <laughs> we'll have, a, have the interview there. Now, one of the things that um, we're going to talk about today, the holiday of Shavuot, which I think a lot of people, it's a kind of a, uh, something that not so many people know about. And people should know about it because what happens in Israel on Shavuot uh, is r quite remarkable. Um, even before we get to the full background of why we're doing it, just so people that are, are watching should be aware, this is one night in the year where throughout Israel, religious and secular, people stay up all night long wow. to study Torah, to study the Bible, to study our traditions. And that's an incredible thing. I, I don't know if there's any other custom like that in any other faith or any other place in the world where literally all the way till sunrise, you stay up all night, you study, and then sunrise there's prayers as the sun uh, begins to shine. And there's an incredible feeling of connection to our traditions and to our texts and to being people of the book, sort of going back to that again. And it's, uh, it's an incredible experience. And, and th does this happen in the synagogue or in, in a study halls or where does that happen? It happens in the, in, in the most incredible places, uh, certainly in synagogues, that's for sure, and in the rabbinic seminaries, but they rent out movie theaters. Wow. Uh, I've spoken to a full movie theater uh, during these nights. Uh, they rent out big spaces and people lecture uh, throughout the night and uh, there, there's this feeling of, I mean, when, when you take a step back for a moment, you say, look at this for a moment. These are people who were exiled for 2,000 years, persecuted all around the world, downtrodden, beaten. And not only have we come back to our land as the Bible prophesied, but here we are alive and well and strong. And alive and well and strong, not just in a military or economic sense, but on a religious level, that we're still connected to that faith. And we're doing what people did 2,000 years ago here, and we're wow. continuing to do so. That's part of the exhilaration of the experience. Wow, and it's, it's uh, the, the whole thing of is, is the kind of coming to Mount Sinai, and yeah. they, every um, festival or feast, they say that you relive it. It's almost like you're there again at Mount. Is that how, the, how you feel? That's it's very much that experience. So this is the date, uh, the 6th of Sivan in the Hebrew calendar that corresponds to the day in which we received the Torah, the revelation at Sinai. That is the defining moment uh, for Judaism and actually for the whole Judeo-Christian uh, ethic. Uh, the idea that God came to the people and revealed himself. Uh, in Exodus 19.9, he basically tells them, Moses is my prophet. Everything he says, he's saying in my name. And we have the revelation of the Ten Commandments. So after we stay up all night, showing our love and our excitement for this Torah which God has given us, we then, in synagogue, as part of the prayers, we read the Ten Commandments. And we, everybody stands, and there's this majestic moment where you are supposed to feel as if you're hearing uh, the Word of God at Sinai and uh, connecting to that experience 3,300 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's, it's truly special. It's very special to be in a synagogue with many generations, uh, to stand there next to our children, and sometimes with our parents, and to experiencing that together. Wow. Wow. If you've just joined us, we've got uh, Rabbi Dov Lippmann in the studio and we're talking about the, the festival of the Shavuot and about the Israeli elections. It's kind of interesting that things are connected as well. You know, that there's the Israeli elections, which is just kind of concluded before Passover. And then you've got from Passover to Shavuot, you have the counting of the, the days are counted down uh, to Shavuot and the whole thing of Mount Sinai. 
Um, well, they're, they're, they're very much linked. That's, I'm happy you raised that. Uh, Passover to Shavuot, uh, it, it's linked one to the other because Passover celebrates our uh, physical freedom from bondage, right. but that freedom is not complete until we become slaves, as it were, to God, meaning we became free to fulfill our purpose here. We didn't become free to run around the world and do whatever we want to do. We became free to be able to be people of God and spiritual. So the connection is very strong. And, and Shavuot, when we celebrate receiving the Torah, is almost like the culmination, uh, the end of the Passover process, because now redemption is complete because we are spiritual people and we have the Torah of God's Word to actually study. And, you know, it's amazing that now you're back in the land that Israel is changing in a phenomenal way. If you haven't been to Israel, you, you, it's a great if you could come here and see the amazing developments with technology, with the, with the infrastructures changing all the time. Jerusalem's changing with the development there and the building. And, and what's incredible is your Shavuot is to celebrate the revelation of God. And if people, you know, you can ask yourself sometimes, is it true? Is it not true? Did God actually, is this book really from God or not? Today, we don't have to ask ourselves that question anymore because you open up the Bible and it, there's a crazy, ridiculous prophecy that will be exiled from the land, will be spread to the four corners of the earth. The land will be a wasteland while we're gone, but eventually God will remember us and bring us back. And, and I mean, for thousands of years, people read that and, and believed that promise, I guess, but now you don't have to believe it anymore. It's happening in front of our right. in front right. of our eyes. The prophecy of the Bible is coming true. The ingathering of the exiles, the reflourishing of the land of Israel. Uh, so we, our being here actually just reaffirms that this is uh, the word of God and this is truth. So it really brings the whole celebration together because it's not just celebrating something which we believe we think happened a few thousand years ago, but we actually know it now because no one other than God could, could prophesize that and make that kind of a promise, which is now coming true before our eyes. And you did that with your family. You came to Ben Gurion and arrived here uh, having, I guess, sold everything or, you yeah. know, yeah. called it a day with the United States and came here as a new immigrant and just absolutely amazing. And it really is. When we, when we were on the flight to come back here, we flew with uh, an organization called Nefesh Benefesh. Every single person on our flight in July 2004 was moving to Israel. And the pilot, uh, in the little spiel that the pilot gives before the flight, at the end he said, uh, everybody sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. I'm here to take you home. Wow. And that was just this amazing moment where you realize this prophecy is actually coming true, and we're, for some reason, blessed to be the links in the chain uh, to bring our family back home. Wow. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is uh, there are many people watching today, uh, and you might find this very interesting, many Christians who are very interested in Shavuot, who are very interested in um, following the Jewish festivals and Jewish feasts. How, 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 does, how does that... Because I know that you've, uh, you've done some work with a, a Christian pastor and on... The, um, the Pasha and, and the weekly study. How, how do you feel about that, that there are a lot of people out there and you're watching today and you're very interested in this, in Shavuot and the... I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful development that uh, we've reached a stage where Jews and Christians can celebrate and study and understand together. You mentioned I was part of the Lone Star podcast with Pastor Trey Graham in Texas, and it was a thrill to go through the weekly portion and every single week and talk about the holidays uh, together with my good friend in, in Texas. Uh, and, and Shavuot, the truth is, I, I think we should emphasize this point. Uh, there are three times in the year when Jews uh, came to the temple. Uh, it's, it's, it's Passover, it's Shavuot, and it's also the Feast of the Tabernacles when there's a big pilgrimage uh, from the Christian community. Uh, we don't believe that the Temple Mount was a place just for Jewish worship. Uh, it was a place that the, the Bible talks about, and it's a place for all nations to come and experience God. Uh, Shavuot starts the season of the Bikurim which is the first fruits. Uh, there's this beautiful ceremony and uh, giving our thanks to God, we bring the first fruits. Here it's springtime and the new fruits are growing and you bring the first fruits to the temple. Uh, that was a process which was a commandment uh, for Jews, but Christians or people of faiths, whatever faith, were welcome to come and, and bring offerings. And, and that's the time that we strive for. Uh, if like I could, a harvest festival, a lot very, of uh, very much people so. refer to it. Exactly. Now. And if I, if I could be political <laughs> for a moment, uh, we live in a time today 
where the Temple Mount is in control uh, in the hands of people who do not let Jews and Christians pray there. Think about that for a moment, that here's the holiest place for all these faiths, and only one faith is allowed to pray there. But in the rest of Jerusalem, which is under broader Israeli control, it's the only time in history that every faith can pray as they choose. You can go to your church, you can go to your mosque, you can go to your synagogue, and uh, we're very proud of that. And part of our prayers for the return of the temple and for a final redemption is that, that the, the idea that there are a few times a year where all nations of the earth can, can make offerings in the temple and we can show that unity of purpose and spirituality, uh, that's something which we, which we yearn for. So we're thrilled that we're along the way, that Christians are interested in study, that we can study together and share our traditions one with the other. And it's a, it's a little bit like the commission you received to be a light to the nations, and when you received the Torah, that it was, f first of all, for the Jewish people, but then it had to be spread to the nations that you were meant to be the light to the nations. One hundred percent. When we talk about the term uh, chosen people, that's a term you hear very often, chosen doesn't mean better. Uh, chosen means people with a responsibility. Uh, you've been chosen with a responsibility. Uh, you now have the Torah, you have the commandments, and you're supposed to light up the earth uh, with those. And that's a responsibility. That's not proselytizing. I want to really emphasize, it's very important. There's a very big difference. Uh, it's not become Jewish. It's hold to your faith, but we'd like to share uh, the values and the teachings that we have uh, with everyone. And that's what being chosen means. It's a real responsibility. I think that having the state of Israel and returning to the land of Israel creates a, a wonderful platform for that. And, the, and the, Israel's doing amazing things around the world with technology, and uh, you've been involved as well with helping in Africa with the solar uh, panels and helping uh, electricity there. And, uh, you know, I was thinking when I was uh, looking at the, the whole thing of Shavuot and the, the giving of the Ten Commandments, one of the things that I suddenly remembered was that your, your father was a in the uh, in the it was a federal judge in in the United States, and that there there was a big controversy about having the actual Ten Commandments in the courts. Yeah, what, what's 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 incredible is uh, I, I I try to not talk too much about what's happening in the United States, and especially as an Israeli politician. But I grew up in America. I was lived there for 32 years, and. Uh, America was founded on principles of faith and God, and the founding fathers were not only fluent in the Bible, many of them were fluent in Hebrew. Uh, they had a, a strong connection to that. I don't think they could have fathomed that we reach a time where people would feel that there's somehow a problem with the Ten Commandments, which is the foundation of civilized society, uh, being in public spaces and being in the courts or, or public prayer in schools. Uh, that's, that's what America was founded on. So I certainly hope uh, that America, as a whole gets back to that concept of spirituality and God. Uh, I used to use American money, and I believe it says in God we trust uh, on the dollar bill, and it says it right above where the Speaker of the, of the House of Representatives uh, sits. It's a foundation uh, of America, at least the America that I, that I grew up in, and I, I hope that it doesn't stray too far from that and goes back to those roots. And, and that's a very interesting point because you, you were involved in the Knesset, and uh, I was wondering how much... Um, how much is the Bible read in the Knesset? How much the, is the Torah read? It, it, and, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, Israel was founded in 1948. The founding fathers of Israel were actually widely very secular, almost anti-God and anti, uh, at least Bible as something to hold to it. I think they studied Bible, but they were familiar with it. But Israel has gone through a process over its 71 years. And uh, as we mentioned politically, that Israel has become more religious and more right in its outlook. Uh, Israel, uh, the, the percentages of people that believe in God, that, that keep to the traditions is very high. When I say very high, I mean 80, 90 percent. Uh, a, a little while ago, we celebrated Passover and throughout Israel, throughout Israel, uh, people sat down at Passover night and had a Seder, and they went through the story of the Exodus, and this is religious and quote-unquote secular. So there's more and more uh, connection to religion in Israel. So you asked about the Knesset. Uh, so they do, for example, at the inauguration, they will read from Psalms. Uh, there are opportunities for spiritual concepts in the Knesset, and we actually, when we entered the Knesset in 2013, uh, a few of us arranged the first member of Knesset Bible study group, wow. and every Tuesday we got together and we studied together 
together. I think that was very important. I think it's very important to uh, bring people, again, from all political backgrounds. They have this in Congress also. They have prayer breakfasts and prayer groups uh, where we put aside politics and say we all can agree about this and we all can come back to the core and, and to our roots. So there's a process happening in Israel. I like to see it more. I've written some columns about my desire to hear God mentioned more. Uh, you know, in America, the president finishes, I think, almost every speech with, may God bless the United States of America. You don't always hear those words, may God bless uh, Israel, and I'd like to hear that, because I think that brings us, reminds us uh, to go back to our core. But there's a process uh, which is taking place, and that's also uh, prophetically uh, taught in the, in the Bible, where it says, you'll come back, you'll reconnect to God, and that's all uh, what we're ha seeing happening today. And how is it for the new immigrants, who, the people who are coming here, Dove, the, the Jewish people who are returning to the land of Israel, are they finding it that they can understand what's happening with the election? And uh... So it's interesting. It takes time uh, to learn that. Many of the parties are learning that they should reach out. Uh, so you'll see a lot of campaign material, certainly in Russian, with close to a million Russian uh, citizens, uh, but also in English, also in Am Amharic for the Ethiopian population. There's French groups now, uh, some Portuguese, and people from Brazil. So you're starting to see uh, adapting to that. Um, and you have immigrants that are represented uh, in the different parties. Uh, so there's definitely an adjustment that's being made. It's confusing. You come from a country with one system, and all of a sudden you're faced uh, with another system. So there's a lot, big effort made uh, to explain it to them. Uh, one of the things which I think in Israel uh, helps the acclamation for the new immigrants, we're talking about Shavuot, is the Jewish culture, is the holidays, is the traditions, is the fact that there's, there's so much that they are familiar with from wherever they're coming from, and that's really a unifying force. Uh, so even if we can be uh, polarized politically, and even if the elections can be confusing and complicated and no one exactly knows what's going on, uh, people feel at home here. They feel at home uh, because of the Jewish nature of the state. And that's something, that's the reason why they came to begin with. And that's why uh, they're able to enjoy their lives here as they do. And there's, there's still a huge amount of Jewish people living in America. Yeah, millions of people. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I speak in the United States often and, and try to call to people at least to explore uh, making Aliyah. There's a, there's, a, there's a history of the Jewish people where we get comfortable in lands. Uh, if you go back to the Second Commonwealth, uh, we were exiled to Babylonia, and then Ezra and Nehemiah, and uh, they, they started coming back to build the Second Temple, and they called the people to come. The same people who 70 years beforehand said, you know, we have to cut off our thumbs and not play the instruments that we play in the temple because we're in such mourning, they basically said, you know what? You enjoy your temple. We're very comfortable here in Babylonia. 70 years uh, to get comfortable. So there is a problem uh, that we have. I, I don't say that everyone must drop everything and move to Israel immediately. You want to do it in a smart way. You want to have planning. But I would like to see more conversation, to see it as a greater part of the education system in the Jewish schools, to be talking about not just supporting Israel, but actually living in Israel. And one of the issues in the United States, just briefly mentioning it, is the, the issue on campuses, the the kind of movement against Israel. Is that is that something you've come across? Or? Absolutely. Uh, the last number of years, uh, certainly with the platform as a member of Knesset and a former member of Knesset, I do travel around quite a bit and try to address uh, what's happening. Uh, I work now for an organization called Honest Reporting, which just reveals the media bias against Israel. So the average college student is growing up in an environment where the mainstream media tends, not always, but tends to be anti-Israel and puts out news that's just misleading about what's happening in Israel. And that takes these students away uh, from certainly Jewish students from their roots, but even non-Jewish students are just misled about what's happening in Israel. Israel stands for human rights. Israel stands for justice. We're the only democracy in the Middle East. We just had an election, a smooth transition of power. Where else does it happen uh, in the Middle East? And we're so proud of that. And Arabs uh, vote for the Knesset. They have representatives in the Knesset. It's a democracy. And so many people don't know that. They see little screenshots of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They see Israeli tanks on the one hand and Palestinian stone throwers on the other hand. And they think that we're somehow this conquering superpower that's abusing another people. Uh, that's why people have to be educated properly. That's part of what we try to do in honest reporting and call out the media. There'll be people watching, uh, you're watching today and you'd like to get involved. They want, you know, we have a, you, there's a lot of people, you'll be watching watching today and you're someone who advocates for Israel, you're getting involved with um, 
defending Israel. Is there, is there a website they can go to? Absolutely. First of all, they can go to honestreporting.com. If they want to literally become partners with us to tell the true story about Israel and talk about the biblical prophecies that are coming true uh, and the incredible country that we have, they can actually email me directly at dove at honestreporting.com, and I'd be happy to get you involved in, in what we're doing. Um, and there's a real effort that we have to make to tell the truth. And people of faith all around the world get this. Uh, they know that there's a, uh, a left-wing, liberal, progressive movement uh, in the world which is trying to pull people away from the biblical uh, faiths and traditions and from truths. Uh, what's happening in Israel is truths. You can't, uh, th there are facts that are on the ground and we try to share uh, those facts and we try to counter uh, the, uh, I'll steal a uh, phrase from the President of the United States, to counter the fake news and, and to really just try to tell the truth. Uh, the Bible tells us, Ure betuv Yerushalayim, see the good in Jerusalem. Uh, the prophet foresaw a time when people were going to harp on this negative story or that negative story, and God tells us through the prophets, see the good of Jerusalem, see how much good is happening. And as you said before, uh, come to Israel, see it for yourselves without any propaganda. Just come and travel around and you'll experience the good that's happening. You'll experience the prophecies uh, that are coming true. And they can certainly, like I said before, be in touch with me directly if they want to partner with us in this effort. And I think that would be a really good for you. You know, there's people you want to be involved. You're out there and you're saying, I'm desperate to be helping Israel. I'm desperate to do something to make a difference. And this is something you can really get your teeth into. They there's, uh, there's so many opportunities, even if it's only writing to your local newspaper or your local TV station and presenting the truth of what's really going on. And they can, there's a lot of information on the Honest Reporting website about uh, stories which you can um, explain the reality of what's really happening. Um, well, it's been great to have you with us today, Dove. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. It's always, always a pleasure. Good, always good to have you. And, and, and blessings we're... to everyone <laughs> who's listening. And thank you for your support and your prayers and your involvement in what's happening in Israel. And uh, we, we look forward to the day when you'll be back in the Knesset and we'll be able to do some filming there and uh, see you. And hopefully that will come one day. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of, of, of what we do here with Israel First television program. If you'd like to support us or get involved, you can go to the website www.israelfirst.org. We love to receive your emails. The email address is info at israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language. Mm -hmm.